This is the Val Triangle, home of Esco, Sassel and many other big industries. Also home to millions of people who work at these industries and their families. They live in grim townships such as Sebokeng, Sharpville, Bopelong and Boipatong. For some, mostly men from KwaZulu-Natal, this is only a temporary home. They live in hostels and their families remain on the land. Back in 1961, the world took notice of this area when the police killed a large number of peaceful demonstrators in Sharpville. Other names, written in blood, have since been added to that of Sharpville, like the Sebukang Night Vigil Massacre of 91 and the Boipatong Slaughter of 92. Christopher Nangalembe was an ANC Youth League member and organizer of the Civil Protection Unit in Sebokeng's notorious Zone 7. On the 5th of January 1991, he was abducted and murdered. At the Truth Commission hearings this week, Mandla Nangalembe identified his brother's kidnappers as members of a local gang affiliated to Inkata and allegedly armed by the police. A vigil was held on the night before the funeral. The family had been warned that violence was likely, and so they asked the police for protection. But the police were nowhere to be seen. The tent was just the, the side of the house here. Yeah. The coast next along the fence there, it was so big that it can accommodate uh, plus minus 300 people. And most of the people were there, and they were sitting inside. It was 2 o'clock in the morning of the 12th of January, 1991. I didn't see anything. I cannot explain what happened to them during the shooting, but it lasted about seven to eight minutes, the shooting going on. When I stood up, the only thing that I heard my sister saying, please come and phone, most of the people are injured as I scared. People who knew him or who know him while he was still alive, wanted to come and pay the last respect in the night vision. Because in the night vision, there were people who were going to you know, express themselves show sympathy to the family, condone the family members, and as well as the people in the community. That is the reason why a lot of, lot of people attended the night vision. I understand my brother was abducted, but when coming to, you know, people who came to give us the last respect and be mowed down like that, I mean, a normal human being cannot do that unless somebody has been hired, trained to do that. Among the attackers were the same men who had abducted Chris Nangalembe a week before. But the killers who shot down the mourners in the tent were strangers. As we were busy loading the people into the ambulances, they told me that the police were looking for me. And they said I should get into the car because they were taking me with. I was very confused at that time. I got into the Casper. But as I was inside, I was asking myself as to why they were taking me. And somehow, I felt that probably they were the ones who had shot at us and I asked them as to where they were taking me. They said I should not ask them because they were doing their job. As we were going, this car which had shot people and abducted my brother was following us. I pointed this car to them and said this is the car that had abducted my brother. They said I must keep quiet because they were doing their job. They took me back. There were four Boer police. They did not even look at the corpses. They just collected the bullets that were strewn, the cartridges that were strewn around the yard. They just ignored the corpses. They even ignored the people who needed first aid who were lying down on the ground. I approached them and showed them that there is the car that had been busy shooting. They did not even pay attention to what I was saying. They flatly ignored me. 38 men and women died that night. Mandla Nangalembe insists the police were involved in the massacre. But his allegations have never been thoroughly investigated, and no one has been convicted for the slaughter. During the trial, the policeman who was handling the case had a difficulty and committed suicide. The following day, I think two days after the trial, Zandi was killed. So you can see that there was something that is hot that the very police cannot handle it. So I did even predict that those people will be acquitted from this day. Because the magistrate, of course, said because of lack of evidence. 
The day after the Sebokeng night vigil massacre, the house of Emma Keswa and her son, Katisi Keswa, was burned down. It was retaliation. Many believe that Katisi was responsible not only for the death of Christopher Nangalembe, but for the killing of 38 people at the vigil one week later. Victor Katisi Keswa terrorized the Val Triangle in the early 90s and quickly earned the name the Val Monster. Ernest Sotsu blames Keswa for the murder of his wife, daughter and grandson in 1991. On the 3rd July 1991, whilst attending the African National Congress, uh, first national, uh, national Congress, to say, in Durban, my family was attacked. My wife, Constance, my daughter, Margaret, and, and uh, grandson, Sabata, were shot dead with AK-47 at close range. Two of my grandchildren, Fuyani and Busi, narrowly escaped death, but were seriously injured with bullet wounds. And as a result, they were kept in the intensive care of Sibukewu Hostel for two months. I called on the investigating officer at that time for an, an identification parade. And I told him that I'm prepared to put my neck on the block. I'll bring my two children who were recently out of hospital to come and identify Curtis, who was then known as a result of that attack of, uh, at my place and, and, and uh, other places as a Val monster. They successfully identified him among the other four uh, murderers who killed my family on the night of the third. The first incident is the one that I had already related that he forced a certain woman to drink acid and that woman died. There were many allegations that Katisi was working for the police. He was repeatedly arrested and convicted to a term of imprisonment, but was inexplicably released. Regardless of what Katisi Keswa was guilty of, his mother, Emma, testified that he was innocent of the murder of Chris and Angalembe. Chris's brother Mandla confirmed this. A few days before Chris's death, Katisi had appeared before a people's court where he was shot. On the following day, we went to the hospital. We got him, he was admitted at the hospital. He said he had only been given panados, but he was never formally admitted. I asked him why wasn't he admitted and put into a ward. Then he said they said they couldn't admit him because he was an IFP member. On the day that he was discharged, I took him to Boxbeck Hospital. I showed him a card that he was at the Sibukeng Hospital, but they discharged him despite the fact that he was as sick as he was. As we were still having this discussion, one of the boys died. The name of that boy was Christopher. It was alleged that my son, Khetisi, had killed Christopher. At that time, Khetisi was still not there. He was at the Boxbeck Hospital. When Chris was abducted at Zone 12, the people I have mentioned were Hunter, Zandi, as well as Temba. And when the, the people saw those people, these names were mentioned three people, but Ketisi was not mentioned. Ketisi Kaswa was arrested in connection with a spate of mass killings in the Val Triangle on the 9th of July, 1993. The next day, he was dead. That was that very same evening when the police had come to fetch us. That was the last time that I saw him alive. Then on the following day, they were busy asking me as to where they could get him.
I was arrested on a Thursday and Friday. Then Saturday afternoon, they came to tell me that he had died. Victor Katisi Kaswa's death is still a controversial issue. The state pathologist proclaimed natural causes. Many say it's a lie. I saw it in the newspaper that the police who were working with him had killed him because they were scared that he was going to reveal the truth. The ANC remains concerned that after so many allegations were made against him, he should die in police custody in mysterious circumstances. We ask, was his death part of a broader cover to prevent information on the sources of violence in the Val becoming known? June 17, 1992. About 300 residents of the Kwamadala Hostel and members of the security forces turned Boipatong into a place of terror. 49 people died that night. News of the massacre reverberated throughout South Africa and the world. This week, some of the survivors told the Truth Commission their story. It was at about 9 o'clock in the evening. And we heard the sound of shattering windows. As we were still asking ourselves as to what the problem could be, we heard some voices mumbling at the door. We heard voices saying, open up dogs, you dogs, open up. They were throwing stones and the stones came through the windows, hitting inside the house. And just as I was getting under the bed trying to hide myself, they gained entry into the house and they asked where the dogs were. As I was trying to hide under the bed, they came, they stabbed me all over the body, they even stabbed me on my neck, and now I'm a quadriplegic. They came to the bedroom, my husband came out and they, they killed him. I wanted to, to, to protect myself and I was cut on the, on the, on the hand and here. Yeah. And my child was also chopped on the head. My child is paralyzed, is on a wheelchair now. They stabbed me, they stabbed me too and they also stabbed on my hand. They were beating me at the same time and my fingers were chopped and my hand was broken and they put the spear through my child. When I looked, I saw the spear right through the body of the child. There were shots and people were, were, were crying. As I was running, a white person said, Zulu, capture him, there he is. And I went straight into the passage. When I got into the passage, they couldn't see me anymore. And I heard a loud bang of a gun behind me seven times. I ran just alongside the sheikhs and I went straight into the weed. You said in your written statement that you heard somebody saying in Afrikaans, cry home Zulu. Was, was, are you positive that it was in Afrikaans that the man spoke? I'm telling the truth there. I realized that police were there, but I felt as if I was dreaming because I didn't believe that police could be there. It was a white person wearing balaclavas. No, round the eyes I could see, and the nose was a sharp, was a sharp nose, and it wasn't that of our black people. Now this group of killers left and the comrades came thereafter. When they arrived, they called us all back. They said, please, come back from your hiding place. They have gone. I searched all over the shack area for my wife and my child. I couldn't find them. And another person told me that, no, I've seen a woman right at the corner there. When I went to investigate, it was my wife. She's been stabbed. She's been shot with pellets. Her intestines were outside. And she said to me, I left the child at one shake. When I went to investigate at the shake, I found my child's head chopped. 
and he was already dead, and he had or, he also had pellets in his body. In the morning, the very same people came. In the very same uniform, they were still like the previous day. They took my name. They said they were they needed some statements as to who had injured the people. I was quite scared to tell them that you are the ones who were here yesterday. They were driving hippos when they came into the township. Even when they went back, they were driving in hippos. Because when we went to Spokane Hospital, the hippos were driving them into Guamadala Hostel. Another victim of the massacre was the already fragile negotiation process when the ANC pulled out of the multi-party talks at Kudesa. We cannot tolerate a situation where the regime's control of state power allows it the space to deny and cover up its role in fostering and fomenting violence. The Buipatong massacre is one of the most chilling instances of the consequences of the actions of the FW de Klerk regime. The regime must immediately end its campaign of terror against the people and the democratic movement. The full story has not been told. All records of police communication that evening have been destroyed. The names of the 17 men who had been convicted were kept secret to protect their families. The Goldstone Commission's report on Boy Patong was never publicly released. Former Flak Blast Commander Dirk Kutsia says the police death squads were responsible. Boy Patong, Flak Blast job. Can you show you that? Brood van Heerden, Brood van Heerden and Snorre Vermeulen. Two of the Flak Blast guys involved blackened with these uh, things that they use.